Hello and welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's really good to have you with us. This week we're looking at a really challenging encounter between Jesus and a Canaanite woman who Jesus is initially very reluctant to help. Before we get started on this, however, if you've not done so already, you may find it useful to download the sheet accompanying this study. And you can find a link to that in the video description in YouTube. On the sheet, you will find the text of today's reading, some other passages you may wish to look up, the questions we'll be considering together later on, and lots of room for you to record your own thoughts and observations. And so then, without further ado, let's dive into this week's passage, which comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 21 through to 28. The setting in chapter 15 is one of conflict. We're told in verses 1 and 2, that some Pharisees and scribes had made the journey from Jerusalem to Galilee in order to confront Jesus, basically about his disciples not keeping oral traditions around hand washing that the Pharisees and scribes considered to be really important. Jesus responds in verses 3 to 9 by arguing that the system of oral laws ends up sort of circumventing some of the commands of the law of Moses. Before then, in verses 10 to 20, turning to the crowds and talking about how it's not what we eat that defiles us, but the stuff that comes from inside us, the evil desires of the heart, as it's put. We got to remember at that time that the heart was seen as the centre of the will and the intellect, as opposed to emotions and feelings as we understand it today. So we're talking essentially about Jesus saying actually the human heart is where evil actions stem from. So that's the background of controversy that sets the scene for what follows. And in this reading we're told that Jesus had left the area of Galilee, presumably looking for a bit of peace and quiet, and headed to the predominantly Gentile area of Tyre and Sidon. And that's where today's reading's action takes place. So in this passage, we've got Jesus, as I say, in the midst of significant religious controversy. He encounters a woman who pulls him up short. The woman is not named, presumably was not known to the early church, but is described as a Canaanite woman. And I'll say more about the significance of that um, mode of address later on. And she comes to Jesus because we're told that her daughter was being terrorised by a demon and she hoped Jesus could set her free. And in this scene, we've also got the disciples, including but not limited to the 12 who formed Jesus's inner circle. And they don't come off in a very positive light here. They seem to behave a bit like the Pharisees and scribes were doing, kind of setting boundaries on who could and could not belong to the kingdom of God. Now, Matthew's gospel was the second of the canonical gospels to be written, probably around 75 to 80 of the Common Era, to a predominantly Jewish audience and following the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in the year 70, all of which contributes to much of what we find within Matthew. We know that the author of Matthew's Gospel had Mark as one of their sources, and that's really quite significant. If we look at Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30, we find the earliest version of Jesus' encounter of this sort of form. But in that reading, he refers to a woman who is known as the Syrophoenician woman, not the Canaanite woman. And also the action takes place in a private house rather than in a public space. So it seems that Matthew takes the same basic happening but transplants it into this particular setting. 
So we knew, say from verse 21, that Jesus had entered the areas of Tyre and Sidon, these two predominantly Gentile towns, following his conflicts with the Pharisees and the scribes. And we know that a Canaanite woman appeared on the scene and started shouting out for help from Jesus, referring to him as Lord and as son of David. So using titles that properly addressed him as belonging to the people of Israel, and in particular being Israel's Messiah. That's where the son of David bit is significant. So she realises who he is, and that's why it seems that she's seeking his help. And it's after she's used these titles that she tells him that her daughter was being tormented by a demon. Now we learn back in chapter 10 that the vocation given to the disciples involved casting out demons just as Jesus himself had done. So this was a key part of what it meant to proclaim the kingdom of God in word and deed. But the situation does not play out so straightforwardly. In Marilyn Salmon's commentary on this passage. She describes the description of the woman as a Canaanite as invoking a deeply ingrained national prejudice. Now at the time there were not any Canaanite people living in that area and so the term defines the woman in a historical context which the first century Jewish audience would have understood more readily than we perhaps do. We need to recall that when the people of Israel were wandering in the wilderness, the land that they were promised they would eventually go into was the land of Canaan, a land that was already occupied. So there was always that tension there. And so the animosity between the Israelites and the Canaanites was a deep rooted one going right back to the days of Moses and Joshua. And so by Matthew, Changing the description from Syrophoenician, which is fairly neutral, to Canaanite woman, he's immediately bringing into view this, this backdrop that first century viewers, listeners, hearers would have been immediately aware of. Now we know that Jesus sometimes talked of Gentiles in Matthew's Gospel, ethne or pater ta ethne in, in the Greek, in negative terms, it's true. So, for example, in chapter 6, verse 7, there's stuff about empty prayers. And in chapter 6, verse 32, there's stuff about fixating on food and drink and what we need rather than on the kingdom of God. As criticisms made of the Gentiles. Jesus is saying, don't do this like the Gentiles do. But there were also positive references in Matthew's gospel to the Gentiles. And perhaps the most prominent of them is in chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, the parable of the sheep and the goats, where it's clear that some of the sheep who will be gathered into the life of the kingdom are Gentiles. And finally, of course, when we get to chapter 28, verses 16 to 20, we see the Great Commission to go to all nations and to spread the word of the coming of the risen Jesus. So we've got this, this background of immediate tension just with the description of the woman. And one assumes that she would have been quite obviously distressed. But at the beginning of verse 23, we hear that Jesus doesn't respond to that. He ignores her. Now that stands in real contrast with the compassion that he showed to the people of Israel that's described at the end of chapter 9. And also in the reading um, that we've had quite recently of the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Part of the reason Jesus responds how he does is for is from a, a place of compassion. So there's something, it seems, quite different that's going on here. It's as if her concerns are nothing to do with him. And his um, reaction doesn't seem to placate the disciples. They are irritated by this woman shouting out. And we learn in the latter part of verse 23 that they ask Jesus to try and get her to go away because she won't stop shouting. Now in verse 22, her appeal for mercy in the Greek is Kyrie eleison. But it's met by a chorus of alliterative apolisons from the disciples. 
um, alliterative in the Greek that is. And so essentially she, she's being mocked by them using similar language to her own to, to tell her to, to go away, to tell Jesus to get rid of her. So we have to imagine this is an incredibly hostile scene that this woman is facing in that, in that environment. Jesus, having tried to avoid engaging with her at all, seems to then in verse 24, try to placate the disciples by saying, I've only come to the sheep of the house of Israel. Taking us back to chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, to what he said to his, his own followers. And thus, he was not uh, centred on Samaritans and, and Gentiles um, who were in need. Now, I've heard some commentators argue that essentially Jesus saw this um, as a distraction, that his laser focus on God's people of Israel um, meant that he couldn't give time and attention to this woman. I think the interaction that follows shows that he was perfectly capable of doing that. And I think there's, there's a danger that we kind of try and gloss over some of the difficult aspects of this passage rather than allowing it to make us uneasy. The woman is not deterred either by Jesus' apparent indifference or the disciples' overt hostility, overt racism. And she does something that means Jesus will not be capable of ignoring her any longer. She comes and kneels at his feet and again asks for mercy. So we've got that pose of a pleading, yes, but also of worship. Very much she's also used the correct sort of titles for Jesus. And again, she's asking for Kyrie Eleison to have mercy upon her. Now, unlike Jesus in this incident, it has to be said, I think her behaviour is really admirable. She makes herself really vulnerable, puts herself in a difficult position, seeking help from somebody whose background would have biased them against her, and all for the sake of her daughter rather than any gain for herself. And she also in this reading, has one of the best one-liners. The response that she gets to her getting down on her knees and making her request again is a, a racial insult, essentially. It evokes all of those ancient um, animosities, those centuries-old prejudices, come together in this depiction of the woman and, by extension, her daughter and, indeed, her whole community as dogs cowering under the table looking to nix the children's scraps of food. Some commentators have argued that the Greek word that's used for dogs here is best translated as sort of puppies, cute puppies, um, as if what's going on is a congenial family meal where someone might slip the dog a little bit of their dinner under the table. But I think that does not make sense of the description of this woman as a Canaanite and the hostility, the jeering of the disciples, something not present in Mark's account. I think it makes much more sense to read this as genuinely hostile. This is a really vicious insult against this woman, who is nonetheless not deterred, as we hear in verse 27, where she effectively says to Jesus, well, call me a dog if you might, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. In this passage, in the behaviour of Jesus, we see him being all too human and arguably reflecting the worst of human nature. It shows us our tendency to fear the other, fear people who are different to us and respond accordingly. Yet we also arguably, in verse 28, see some of the best of human nature as the woman's response cuts through all that stuff, whatever Jesus had going on, the reason he responded badly, and it forces him to see her as a fellow human being in the image of God. In other words, her reaction enables common humanity to be what matters here, not othering. And he doesn't refer to her thereafter as, as, as Canaanite or anything like that. He just says to you, you know, woman, your faith is great and your daughter is healed. And indeed she is. Now, as I say, we can praise the character of the woman in this scene for her 
willingness to make herself vulnerable, put herself at risk, and for her resilience in the face of the hostility of Jesus and his group of friends. But I think she shouldn't have had to be resilient. I don't think she should have needed courage in order to approach Jesus and for him to show the same compassion that was shown to various members of the House of Israel. I think by including this story and casting it in this way, I mean, it being such a negative portrayal of Jesus, I think it's almost certainly got historical roots. I think by casting it in this way, Matthew is trying to make us uncomfortable. I think Matthew wants us to feel this is not right, to feel angry, to feel perturbed, uh, to feel shaken, perhaps, by what we find here. Perhaps this was a challenge to some of the insularness that there may have been in Matthew's own community and, and pushing away of the Gentiles. And certainly we see enough of that tension play out in the early century, uh, decades of the church, rather through what we find in the book of Acts. I think sometimes difficult readings and the emotions that they generate for us can point to what God is actually saying to us. So I think as hard as this passage is to grapple with, we need to sit with how it makes us uneasy and not try to gloss over it, not pretend this was just friendly banter between the woman and Jesus or that we're thinking about cute Andrex puppies or anything like that and actually grapple with the uneasiness of it and the theological questions it raises. Because then I think we get a much fuller sense of how we too today need to stand against othering against pushing people away. With all of that in mind, we now turn to our questions for this week. <laughs>